and I am fighting for my son, of course. But it is bigger than Ross and bigger than a website. I think one website is by far less dangerous than the government trampling on our rule of law and the Constitution. I think that is very alarming. And um, to see it up close and personal the way I am um, makes it very real. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today I'm talking with Lynn Ulbricht. She is the mother of Ross Ulbricht, who is the defendant known as Dread Pirate Roberts, the uh, alleged proprietor of Silk Road. He is going on trial in November for what could be one of the most important trials, certainly of the web and certainly of, uh, of this year. He is charged with narcotics trafficking, computer hacking, money laundering, running a continuing criminal enterprise. Lynn, thanks for talking to us. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, your son has pleaded not guilty on all charges? That's correct. Would you say uh, you believe completely in his innocence, that he is not Dread Pirate Roberts? I do. I believe yeah. in Ross. He's a man of his word, and um, I do believe in him. In a, in a way, obviously, you're, you're going to be predisposed to believing in your son mm, and believing in his, in his innocence. But one of the reasons we're talking with you is because you've become an outspoken advocate of why this trial matters to people who don't know Ross Ulbricht, who people who never used Silk Road, who have never bought legally or illegally pot or any other kind of drug. Let's talk a little bit about this. Um, and some of the arguments that you and your uh, Ross's lawyers, who are Joshua Drittel and Lindsay L Lewis, have talked about this matter is because you believe it opens the door for the censure uh, of a free internet. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, the prosecution relies very heavily on something called transferred intent. And basically what that does is makes one person responsible for the intention and actions of another person. And in this case, it's website host is responsible and in conspiracy with the users of the site and the ultimate user of the product, I believe, um, just by na the fact that they are on the site. And Forbes, um, Eric Goldman recently wrote about this in Forbes, and he said this is going to put a chill on the Internet because how can a website host know what's go every single thing that's going on a site. And a lot of them do kind of know that there's illegitimate stuff going on. So this is kind of like if you're running a site, uh, you know, and it, there's uh, a bunch of people, uh, you know, start swapping, uh, you know, prostitution services mm -hmm. or something. As it stands now, for the most part, if you're the web host and you're not specifically party to that, you're, you can't be charged with criminal activity. Correct. That's under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. So that's like if you as an individual took one of them to court in civil court, they would be immune. However, if the federal government took them to court in criminal court, mm -hmm. they would have no protections whatsoever, which Joshua Draytel says creates a dangerous anomaly and opens a crack in the door for precedent to be set here. Because if Ross were convicted, it, he'd be the first website host ever to be convicted for the actions of the users of the site. And the federal government said in their responses to the motions, um, our laws are expansive and adaptable, especially when it comes to the Internet. Of yeah, what, where does that come from? Uh, do you know uh, the idea that the Internet is uh, you know, somehow a looser place for law enforcement than meat space? Well, exactly. And the, the Supreme Court just um, made the, it clear that it is not, that the mm -hmm. digital information falls under the protections of the Constitution just like anything else mm -hmm. in the Riley versus California case, mm -hmm. uh, which go, takes us into illegal searches and seizures. Talk a bit more about uh, transfer intent and yeah, how, yeah. how that's playing out with uh, Federal Express as well. Yeah, the uh, Federal Express was recently indicted for drug trafficking mm -hmm. because they're holding them responsible for people using their service to transport illegal prescription drugs. So the idea here, I mean, the, the idea that, to bring it back to the notion that this case matters because it opens the door to a kind of censuring of, of the market on the internet, but also a chilling effect is that suddenly if you're a web host and you can be held responsible for things people are doing or saying on your website, you're in big trouble. Well, I mean, it's, it's, and it's not only me saying it, um, you know, Eric Goldman in his Forbes article right. said, you know, why would someone go take the chance? It's one thing to risk your money. It's mm -hmm. another thing to risk your freedom. And it, it's not even an excuse to say, oh, I didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. Because you're supposed to know what's going on, according to the government. And I mean, to be fair, though, Silk Road was positing itself. I mean, it was selling itself as a marketplace of illicit and, uh, you know, oftentimes either gray market or black market goods and services. Well, from what I understand, and I didn't go on it, I don't know that much about it really, is that it initially was an anonymous marketplace that was mm -hmm. consumer 
directed. Mm -hmm. But yes, of course, yeah. there were illicit things on there. So, but the point is, it's the principle involved and mm -hmm. the precedent that will be set. Right. So I'm not here to defend Silk Road at all, or yeah. drug use or anything. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what our lawyers are saying is that this opens up a dangerous little crack in the door. And well, they're doing it with FedEx. I don't right. think anybody thinks FedEx is you know, a drug really marketplace. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, okay. Another reason why you say the case matters uh, is that vague allegation, you know, that it's built on vague allegations that don't cite specific crimes, and so that violates the Fifth and Sixth Amendments. Talk a little bit about uh, how that plays out in this case. Right. They speak in very sweeping generalities in the in indictment, which is uh, not in constitution, uh, directly in opposition to the Fifth Amendment in due mm -hmm. process, which says allegations must be specific. And they talk about others known and unknown, mm -hmm. a series of violations, or malicious software, certain narcotics laws, without naming a specific one. This is void for vagueness, according to the courts. This mm -hmm. means you have to cite specific allegations. Otherwise, these allegations, how do you defend yourself against something vague? Mm -hmm. It's, and this goes, is, is the government making the case that, oh, well, because this is internet-based, we don't have to be quite as exact, or do you think it's just sloppy prosecution? Well, actually, um, our lawyers did try to get some specifics out of them informally before mm -hmm. the motions, and what they got back was an email saying, you have all the specifics you need. Mm -hmm. That was all the explanation they gave. They didn't say why. Following up on that and in a slightly different uh, uh, but related way, uh, there are Fourth Amendment concerns that are raised here about mm -hmm. um, also kind of detailing, giving actual detailed specific understandings of where certain types of evidence comes from and, and how it was found. Right. Talk a, and uh, just recently your uh, lawyer, uh, the lawyers for Ross, um, uh, put in motions about the Fourth Amendment saying that all of this evidence should be uh, you know, basically taken out. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that. Okay, sure. First of all, they have not said how they found the Silk Road server, what methods they used. This is required. And if you don't say how, then how do you even know the evidence wasn't fabricated? Mm -hmm. I mean, or that's my question. Um, so they need, the, the motions are saying, you need to tell us how you found the server. Mm -hmm. If they, and, and the they server, did not have a warrant we, for it. We don't know for sure, but it's widely believed that the server was in a foreign country somewhere. Correct. correct? Right. Yeah. Um, I believe Iceland. Right. Um, so then there's the question, did you need a, need a warrant? There's mm -hmm. precedent for that in the Microsoft case where the government had a warrant and was able to go to a foreign server mm -hmm. and get the information. But from what I understand, it's still required by the Fourth right. Amendment to have a warrant. So uh, basically part of the argument then is that if the, if the server was in a foreign country and the government somehow got into uh, they got it and were able to mirror it or basically take everything off it. Um, that, you know, where is the warrant for that or under what mm -hmm. circumstances did they mm -hmm. get that right. information? Exactly. If it was procured illegally, mm -hmm. then all the evidence deriving from that is inadmissible. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much, I, one would assume that's the case right there. It could be. Yeah. But there's also other um, violations. For instance, there's 14 searches and seizures in this case, mm -hmm. and there's more than one that have no warrant. Mm -hmm. But the other issue is um, a warrant needs to be specific, as we were talking right. about, and um, it needs to um, be satisfy probable cause, the reason, a legitimate reason to go after it. Mm -hmm. Here, they're what call, are called general warrants, mm -hmm. where it's a fishing expedition through all your, your property. And um, this is, it, unlimited rummaging through everything, hoping to find something. Mm -hmm. This is the same kind of warrant that we had the Revo American Revolution over, that mm -hmm. Thomas Paine wrote Common Sense about. Right. It's um, to violate this, to violate the Fourth Amendment, weakens all of our protections. Right. And that's why I think this is a much bigger case than just Ross. One of the concerns that the defense has is that the NSA was pursuing a kind of parallel construction um, explain what parallel construction is and why it raises real concerns. From what I understand, parallel construction relies on um, information that is procured by the NSA illegally, mm -hmm. so it can't be revealed, and then they construct a, an investigation that's not real, mm -hmm. but it's an explanation of how they found the target 
that is not actually how they found it. So that would be something like the NSA who goes, you know, finds a server in Iceland or whatever, or they, mm. you know, the DEA or some other federal law enforcement agency gets information from the NSA and then they create a false story that exactly. would put it within the, the realm of, of a legal kind of right. uh, investigation. Yeah, old fashioned detective work right. versus. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. okay. And I guess it's also, this goes back to that question of the government kind of trying to treat the internet differently than, you know, kind of established right. real, you know, real empirical reality is the idea that um, if they, you know, because there's no there there, they mm -hmm. can be everywhere without uh, following the same kind of, uh, of judicial processes. Well, the Supreme Court has proven that they do not agree. <laughs> You know, recently right. with Riley versus California with an illegal, illegal search of a cell phone. Yeah. So one of the other things uh, that you talk about the case mattering about is that, um, you know, in this and in through all of the discussion and the discourse around it, the government and, and many people in the media who talk about it or whatnot, um, you know, the government is equating interest in uh, like a desire for privacy with criminal intent. Uh, talk a little bit about that and, and why that matters. Well, from what I understand, in their response to the motions, they said that if you use Tor, for example, mm -hmm. you, you must Which is have short criminal. for the onion router, and right. it's a, uh, an encrypted web serving process or commu online communications process that was actually partly developed by the government to help dissidents in, in repressive regimes. So it's ironic that mm -hmm. you know, if you're using Tor now, you're right. immediately suspect of, of doing something wrong. Exactly. And so it's really saying that wanting privacy, that you don't have a right, maybe there's lots of reasons why you might want privacy. Mm -hmm. And so that seems to me, it's again, expansive mm -hmm. as far as what they um, are doing here. This it appears to be a case where uh, the federal government is trying to expand money laundering, or this would be the first place where they would be able to uh, kind of extend money laundering um, uh, crimes or criminal statutes to digital currency. Mm -hmm. Um, because there's a lot of Bitcoin involved here, uh, and your son was uh, found or is alleged to have ha had hundreds of Bitcoins, uh, which his lawyer has actually also asked for back. How does expanding money laundering statutes to digital currency, uh, you know, why should that worry us? Well, I guess it depends on what the definition of money is, and that's mm -hmm. this big fight the government's having with itself. Um, and... Uh, and by yeah. that, you mean earlier this year, the IRS actually right. ruled that Bitcoin is not money. It's property. It's property, and so can be taxed. Transact it's more like stocks, which mm -hmm. you, can, you can own, but then you get taxed on the, uh, the appreciated value. Right. Yeah. And, and FinCEN said it's not legal tender in any jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. But then the prosecution, what to me is concerning about what they're saying is everything should be funds. Mm -hmm. Forget digital currency, everything, barter. Mm -hmm. You know, at Porkfest, people were trading eggs for, someone made the point that we're trading eggs for whatever, mm -hmm. and bread, is that funds? No. Yeah. Any exchangeable property. Well, of course, this, this expands the money laundering liability of people and creates a whole bunch more criminals, just like a whole new class of criminals with website hosts. Is this a new class of criminal now, a website host, if someone does something on their site that... Mm -hmm is illegitimate. He was also charged originally, or not charged, but among the things that were brought uh, to bear was with setting up or conspiring to commit six murders. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and the role that that charge, which is not what he's on trial now for, how did that play into the way that he's been treated by the federal uh, government? Correct. Um, at his bail hearing, um, the federal government used those murder for hire allegations to deny him bail. Um, saying he was dangerous, which, if you knew Ross, is the most absurd allegation ever. Um, he, and so then, two and a half months later, Sarah and Turner, the prosecutor, did not indict him for one single murder for hire charge, mm -hmm. even though he used it to deny him bail. So there were six murder for hire charges. That and this was, is when he was picked up, or he was arrested last October in yeah. 2013. Correct. That was part of the story, is that he had, be, he had been mm -hmm. a kind of genial computer hacker or programmer, kind of layabout, nice guy who had transformed himself into this sinister uh, dark net, dark web, Silk Road operator who was running an operation that uh, in 2013 had something like $1.2 billion in illicit trade going on. Mm -hmm. And that he was hiring people to kill people he thought were threats to his empire. 
Yeah, they well they didn't, but they didn't indict him for right. that in New York, wh who is in charge of the of the case right, right now. So five out of six of those charges are now um, uncharged crime, mm -hmm. which does not require proof. And actually, the recent motions are saying these need to be taken out of here. Mm -hmm. They're a mention and they're prejudicial to the jury. Right. Um, there is a final sixth one that is in Maryland that's just kind of been there since October. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen with that. Um, frankly, I don't know. It's just sitting there. In a long uh, New York Times Magazine story or earlier this year, Ross was uh, described among other things. Uh, the title was Eagle Scout, Idealist, Drug Trafficker, question um, mark. He was described among other things as a uh, ardent libertarian. Um, what, you know, what are or what were his political beliefs? Do you share them and uh, where did they ar arise from? Yeah. Well, and that brings up a First Amendment issue in, in the indictment, actually, because they are going, and it's brought up in the motions, is they're going back pre-Silk Road mm -hmm. to his Facebook and other postings and using his political and economic views against him, mm -hmm. um, which I think implicates the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know, I can't really speak to that very well. I mean, I know that he's written about it mm -hmm. and that he was interested in the Von Mises Institute. Mm -hmm. um, and as you know, um, so that's you know. What um, about your uh, yourself and your husband and your family? I mean, dealing with this, how has this affected your um, you know your kind of belief in government institutions and uh, the ability of uh, you know of of the courts to act fairly and mm -hmm. and wisely? Well, you know, I am a believer in the Constitution. I think it's a you know inspired document, and I, it's very disturbing to me to see it. Um, abused. And I think that that's what's happening here. I feel like the Bill of Rights is on trial as much as Ross is. And it's very concerning. But actually that concern kind of fuels my energy because, and I am fighting for my son, of course, but it is bigger than Ross and bigger than a website. I think one website is by far less dangerous than the government trampling on our rule of law and the Constitution. I think that is very alarming. And um, to see it up close and personal the way I am, um, makes it very real. And I think it's, despite, I think the defendant and the allegations in this case are secondary. Mm -hmm. I know they're controversial. I, m much of it cannot be defended in terms of, you know, people's morality or whatever. But it's, what's really important here and what's dangerous here is how the government is operating. And that is something that I've really opened my eyes to. How, how do you feel that the uh, treatment um, of the, the story and of your story and of your son's story has been in the media so far? I mean, I'm, you've talked about Forbes has done a lot of sympathetic coverage and it, coverage that's sensitive to many of the issues raised. The New York Times Magazine story really seemed to, you know, come down very heavily on the idea that the, the feds had gotten their man mm -hmm. and that your son had become this, you know, Dread Pirate Roberts. Um, how do you, how important is the media coverage and where do you see it uh, falling? Well, yeah, I mean, sensationalistic coverage, I guess, sells more uh, copies. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that the majority or many are disappointing for, mm -hmm. to me. They just um, have tried and convicted Ross already. They don't use alleged, as you very kindly did mm -hmm. and responsibly. They, um, and I sometimes will tweet them or, or message, say, hey, mm -hmm. how about using alleged? Um, he has not been convicted. We have a presumption of innocence in this country. And um, it's hurt. It's hurt his reputation, and it certainly has suppressed fundraising. Um, I understand people's reaction to it. Mm -hmm. The fact that they have not indicted him for it, why not? If you mm -hmm. have the evidence, why not? Mm -hmm. And that to me, ca but the media doesn't really talk about it that much. Mm -hmm. The uh, trial is going to last four to six weeks by the estimates I've read. Um, what, um, you know, does that sound about right to you? And um, what is, uh, you know, what's the worst outcome that can happen? What kind of, what kind of sentencing is Ross facing if, uh, if he's found guilty on all charges? Right. Um, time frame is, pro again, estimated. Mm -hmm. It sounds about right. Um, he's facing what would add up to be his life. Mm. There's mandatory minimums, which we can talk about those sometime, yeah. but um, add it all up and, you know, he's facing how, how draconian consequences. How is he holding up through all of this? Because he's been in prison now for or jail months. for 10 months. So, mm -hmm. Ross is a very strong person. He's very resilient and he does have a big picture outlook on things and um, he's holding up as well as can be expected, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, 
be people have commented, you know, probably better than most. Mm -hmm. um, he tries to keep a positive attitude, be a good um, force in the prison. He, had a, he was conducting a physics class, a yoga class. He, he is a very positive person. However, it is very challenging. Um, now he's working on discovery when he's allowed to have access to it, and that's very grueling under difficult circumstances. Um, but he's, he's persevering. Where are the uh, most interesting allies that you've found in kind of talking about the larger issues of the cases? And then are there any people who you would have expected to be, you know, reaching out or being allies in this who have just disappointed you? Well, we've had a lot of anonymous donors through Bitcoin, which mm -hmm. um, would be expected. Um, Roger Ver came out um, with a retweet campaign that um, uh, was very supportive and very mm -hmm. helpful, where he's going to be donating a substantial amount to our fund over time. Uh, uh, explain who he is. Um, well, I guess he's the Bitcoin Jesus, yeah. <laughs> Bitcoin evangelist and uh, angel investor mm -hmm. and a major figure in the Bitcoin world. Mm -hmm. um, but he's been supportive, and there's been other people um, who care about um, freedom and the larger issues here beyond um, the details mm -hmm. and um, Have, uh, the Fest. electronic uh, the electronic frontier mm. foundation has been um, has been supportive is that right they have I mean from the beginning I talked to people there who helped us find Joshua Draytel mm -hmm. um, and he's conferred with them mm -hmm a lot and yes they are supportive. Uh, where is the uh, best place to uh, for more information on the case? Where uh, should people go? Yeah we have a website um, freeross.org mm -hmm. and it has information on the case, ways to donate, um, ways to contact us. We definitely need help uh, with donations as well as you know information, uh, advice, contacts, all that kind of thing. We, we're small, we, we're fighting a big fight and we really need help. Well, we will leave it there. Thank you, Lynn Albrecht. Lynn Albrecht is, so the, is the mother of Ross Albrecht, who is facing trial in November on charges of running Silk Road and being Dread Pirate Roberts. The outcome uh, will affect him if he's found guilty on every, all of the charges. He's, uh, it's an effective life sentence, and it may well affect uh, the outcome of the Internet and the ways uh, in which we deal with things in, in cyberspace. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.